This podcast is part of the Batman Universe Podcast Network, hosted by the BatmanUniverse.net. Check out everything related to Batman and the entire Bat family at the BatmanUniverse.net, including news and original content related to comics, movies, television, merchandise, video games, and more. Also, check out some of the other unique podcasts that TBU has to offer. Consider supporting this podcast by becoming a patron on Patreon. Even $1 can go a long way in supporting this content that you enjoy. Look for a link over at thebatmanuniverse.net to offer your support now. And now, on with the show. For hand listeners, unfortunately, I had technical issues and I lost my entire side of my first session with Professor Allen. I am so bummed about it. Um, so what I've done is gone through and tried to re-record my side of our conversations as best I could. Unfortunately, I had to cut out a lot of our banter, which just breaks my heart because we had so much fun. Um, so hopefully nothing too strange comes through with this, but if you s hear anything odd, it's because I'm trying to record this with memory and trying to, to save as much as I can. Sorry. Greetings, Gothamites. Welcome to Batman Books, The Dark Knight in Prose, where the only pictures are those formed in the imagination. I'm Lane, and... Today is a special episode because we are starting book number four. We also have a different co-host. We have set Pax Free, returned him to his people. With me for this book will be the one and only Professor Allen. Welcome, Professor. Hello, Lane. It is good to be here. It's great to have you. I've been listening to your episodes with Pax, and that is going to be a, I'd just say, tough person to follow. I'll do my best. I will try to bring probably not as much energy, but, uh, you know, I, I'm going to try. I'm going to try, okay? <laughs> yeah, Pax patiently did his time. Bless him. We didn't intend for Batman Returns to take two years, <laughs> uh, but life kind of gets in the way. The pandemic oh, got my in the way. Lands. Uh, now, I, I'm not trying to uh, point any fingers, but the first two books where I didn't have Pax... There was no pandemic. Coincidence? I hmm. think not. Interesting. I, I think not. Professor, tell us where the listeners can find you. Uh, most of what, uh, what we do is at the Relatively Geeky Podcasting Network. That was a network founded by me and my now 30-year-old child. Oh, my lands. That is scary to say. And uh, we do uh, the Short Box Showcase. We do the Quarter Bin Podcast, talking about the best comics ever. Cheap comics. Cheap is the best. The cheaper, the best. Free comic book day, right around oh, the corner. I didn't know that was National a thing. National holiday, it should be. See? And uh, and uh, we do a occasional Doctor Doom a podcast as well. A Doom Speak. Hashtag Quarter Doom. No, we do not complain. That we do don't <laughs> combine those. I, I see what that you did you, there. Stella. You you and Stella, you and Stella working behind the scenes against me. I know what this is. <laughs> <laughs> so that is most of what we do. We also do a few years ago. We started a side project called Dorkness to Light, where nice. we look at pop culture things through the lens of spirituality, religion, theology, those sorts of things too. Lovely, lovely. So, that is what we do, and uh, and I guest on podcasts as well. I like <laughs> this one here. So the book we're covering will be The Forensic Files of Batman, written by Doug Munch. Minch? How, do you, how would you pronounce that? I believe it is Minch, and that is according to a once long ago Marvel put a pronunciation guide. In like a 1980 comic, I found it recently, you know, reading through old back issues, and I scanned it and took a picture of it 
because I, I was going to need to know how to pronounce many of those names. And at least, at least 40 years ago, he was going by Mitch. The interesting thing for me reading this book is it will be my first novel written by a Batman fan. Mm, and let me explain mm-hmm, that. Mm-hmm. Um, the, first, the first one was a novelization. It wasn't a, a standalone novel. It was very much confined to the movie it was written after. The second one, Batman the Ultimate Evil by Andrew Vax, was my first novel. But if you listen to the interview, uh, Vax is not a Batman fan. He was recruited by DC to write. The third book, again, was a novelization. So this one will be my first novel written by someone who knows the character in and out. Because Doug Minch, who was born in Chicago, Illinois in 1948. A good Midwestern man. That's what we like. Good. Absolutely. Those Midwesterners (laughs) are good people. Has worked at Marvel and DC. And let me read the the back of the novel here. During the course of his long career in solving murders and bringing murderers to justice, Batman has kept detailed case file notebooks that reveal as much about himself as they do about how to solve even the most confounding crimes. In The Forensic Files of Batman, noted Batman writer Doug Minch creates a rich trove of entries and case files, undercovering the inner secrets of the Batman's greatest cases and their solutions. Here you will read first-hand accounts of how the Dark Knight brought to justice such infamous murderers as Harvey (laughs) Dent, a.k.a. Two-Face, and the insane criminal known as the Joker, how he faced down the murderous Poison Ivy and trapped the revenge killer who called himself the Scarecrow. But beyond these headline-grabbing villains, Batman faced even more deadly psychopaths, and the details of these cases, too, are here. The common thread to cracking all of these cases is his forensic skills. Now, inside the book, we have a a key to forensic icons that will be appearing throughout the book. And and these icons are black on dark gray. (laughs) So, yes, it's it's Batman's colors. That's the problem. No bright colors, not even really good contrast. So I almost have to hold it at a tilt to really see what's going on. Um, So we have um, autopsy performed. Serial murders female, corpse found in water, victim was bound, hairs recovered, genetic evidence, ballistics evidence, microscopic pathology, stab wounds, crime scene collection of raw evidence, blood drops and spatters, corpse or skeletal remains, powder burns, fingerprint evidence, Cat burglar. Oh, I wonder who that could be. Explosive device used. Victim hanged. Crime scene set afire. Evidence of arson. Blunt trauma. Handgun used. Dental pathology. Entomological evidence. Colon. Insect infestation of corpse. And the final icon, which needs no label, is the bat signal. Mm-hmm. So I, I like that. And, and each of these little articles or stories or secret files has a number of those at the beginning of it, you know, relating to the nature of the crime or the victim or the type of evidence that is going to be utilized or discussed. Yeah, it, it sounds like, and I have not read ahead too far, so just going going by what I flipped through, Uh, It seems like sort of an interesting mix of fact and fiction, you know, where it's actually going to teach us a little bit about forensics, about cause of death and uh, investigative, you know, procedures and, I don't know, profiling sort of things like that within the context of, of Batman. And it seems like some of it is in, you know, prose storytelling and some of it is in the form of these case file. So it's very intriguing. But I think this is genius on your part, Lane, because you're taking this podcast now into the lucrative field of true crime. This is gene. The money is going to roll in. Netflix is knocking at your door. This is this is brilliant. But the book really does have 
seem to have this sort of mix of mix of, of fact and fiction. They're definitely an interesting choice. I'm really looking forward to this book because we really get into the detective side of Batman, which we got some of that with Andrew Vax. I have to say, I heard one of our friends recently on a podcast. I actually don't remember who, but they were talking about writers who, they sort of always write the same thing. And they brought up Andrew Vox. And they said, well, everything he does is about human trafficking and child abuse. That's all he ever writes about. I said, well, yeah, that's actually what he cares about. He he looks for any any excuse, any reason, any opportunity to write a story with those elements in, uh, in it. Right. Andrew Vax wasn't a novelist who only writes human trafficking. He's an advocate fighting against human trafficking that gets his message out by writing novels. Exactly. Exactly. I'm looking forward to digging into this. I like, just in general, my my favorite Batman is the world's greatest detective version of Batman. Because I like, uh, I'm, a, I, I'm a fan of both of the world's greatest detectives, Batman and Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> they, sort of, they sort of both came into my life when I was about 10, and I have not exited either phase yet. Are you ready to dive into the prologue? Well, first, first, let me just say, you did, uh, you did mention the kind of cool looking cover that is an Alex Ross. Yeah, with some cool blacks and light grays and shadow and... I mean, that's that's why it looks so good. And I went uh, I went page by page by this, and I do want to mention even before we get to the forensic icons in the acknowledgments, I want to give Doug Mensch credit for mentioning both Bob Kane and Bill Finger. Yes, I did notice that actually. I really appreciated that he did that. Yes, yeah, he says. Yeah, without them, the Dark Knight detective would not exist, leaving many a baffling and bizarre crime unsolved. And he also mentions Julia Schwartz, editor in the 60s, for giving a, a re- redefinition, a much-needed uh, boost to Batman at that time. So I appreciate Mench knowing and appreciating his comic book history. Shall we dive into the prologue? Yeah. Rusen Peace Theater is proud to present That Time Professor Allen Reads the Prologue. Alfred, you were right. The close call after last night's Arkham Asylum debacle, as you tried to stress in no uncertain terms, was indeed an object lesson in mortality. No one, not even the Batman, lives forever. Consider this note, therefore, to be a covert clause in Bruce Wayne's last will and testament. I have been compiling secret accounts of the Bat's more important or interesting experiences to date, begun more or less as diary entries, including some written as a youth struggling to reach an uncertain future. These writings were originally meant for private and personal use only. Once... Our collaborative enterprise actually began, however. I realized a larger potential. The entries became more detailed, even as they evolved into subjective case files, containing certain insights, all with value for the future. Should the Batman survive long enough to retire, I will decide the fate of these files personally. The vague intent is to somehow share them, perhaps in sanitized form with a crime historian or even as they stand with a successor, if one ever comes to exist. The latter chance, of course, is probably remote. And yet, other than mortality, who knows what the future may hold or how this ongoing mission will end? Should it terminate abruptly? On the other hand, I'm afraid the care... An ultimate dispensation of these documents falls to you. Feel free to add any of your own insights that may have value. Some of the passages are admittedly melodramatic, but they were written while the experiences were fresh and impressions vivid. It felt important to convey both. 
threaded through all the subjective blood and thunder. More important, the accounts convey useful information about criminology in general, as well as detailed data regarding specific forensic tools and techniques. These aspects illustrate the importance of the smallest clue and slightest trace evidence. Placed within their context of actual cases, they further show how unknown murderers were identified and apprehended. In certain cases, they even demonstrate how additional deaths were prevented. This is what it's all about, obviously, the whole point of our shared mission. And last night, a side old friend, we've done fairly well thus far. If anyone eventually benefits from our experience, if just one future victim is spared, all the better. You can find the material in the South Cavern Walls Evidence Storage third vault drawer from the left bottom row. If and when our secret no longer matters, feel free to share some or all of these accounts, notes, in case files at your discretion and with whomever you deem most appropriate. As things stand right now into the foreseeable future, my own obvious choice would be Police Commissioner James Gordon. Thank you, B.W. The prologue is written as a sort of letter to Alfred the butler, and it makes mention of something happening last night that makes Bruce really feel his mortality. And I'm curious if that is going to come back in the climax of the book, perhaps, or is this going to be left as an unknown? Because I really think either one would work. Uh, Professor Allen, your initial thoughts on the prologue? I think this sets us up, you know, talking about this idea of Bruce and Alfred, you know, Bruce working together. We get the context for the, the fictional history of what this book is, right? That that this artifact is the secret files. Now, spoilers, if we have it in our hands, does that mean this is post-mortem to Bruce Wayne? That's all I'm asking. Oh, that's a good question. What year is this? What what year is this taking place in? It's like when you read Lord of the Rings and you realize that part of the story or the story ends with the book you're holding in your hands. How do we feel about this all being on paper probably? Hmm. What would be the proper storage venue for this? How long how long are these documents going to last? Hmm. Well, the Batcave wouldn't have very good humidity control, and you have the potential of bat guano dropping on it. Uh, But temperature control should be pretty steady, and it's safe from sunlight. So, hmm, a little one, a little the other. Do you think he bags and boards his reports? That's what I want to know. Are these in short boxes? Long boxes? We need answers, Lane. We need answers. (laughs) Uh, I I think some of my listeners might not like hearing this, but the best way from an archival standpoint to store your items like this is to lay it down flat. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. The boards and the bags help, uh, but even CDs, books, you know, gravity works against that. Let gravity work for you. But on the flip side of that, are you trying to store them for longevity or are you storing them so that you can quickly access them yes i'm also not a collector in the sense of having to preserve and store for value or any purpose like that my storage is for convenience sake only introduction crime most foul from the private files of bruce wayne Murder is the ultimate arrogance, the one crime transcending all others by monstrously erasing its victim. It is also the foul deed that forever altered my future, shaped my sole reason for living. Having felt its effect and feeling it still, I know it to be permanent. I cannot escape murder, 
and I can never forget its horror. Murder will never leave my mind. I loathe this ultimate evil, and I must always remember why. I am both the sole survivor and the third victim of a horrific double killing. It happened when I was still a child, just a child. But the blood remains more vivid than the broken glass strewn across the carpet of this room. I can still see that blood flowing from the two people I loved and needed most, spilling into the filth of the alley, the fabric of precious life fouled and forever lost. And I can still hear the fatal gunshots, awful explosions cracking the night without warning to destroy my world. So we, you know, we, we don't think that Bruce was a podcaster, but he seems to have been a blogger. Ah, yes, he was. That, that, that's the other thing I was thinking about these diary-like Dear diary. diary. That's right. It was a dark and stormy night. <laughs> I am the dark. I am the night. I am the storm. Novelizations are great for what they are, but the two that I've read kind of stuck to the surface. So I'm really looking forward to getting into the head of Batman again. But we we can't, you know, I haven't read far enough to make this conclusion, but looking at Mench's history with Batman, his long association, if someone is going to try to get into Bruce's head, potentially the right person at least. So we can judge that as we go. We can judge that as we go. It might seem a little odd to have a prologue and yeah. an introduction but mm-hmm. i think it works here the prologue was that letter to alfred this introduction uh tells us a little bit about why mm-hmm. bruce is interested in forensics in the first place of course it gets a little bit into his background about his parents being mm-hmm. killed in front of him and that is what drew him into wanting to fight crime because he is a victim of a double homicide. He, it says he's the lone survivor mm-hmm. and the third victim. Right. And it, this crime has colored his outlook on life for the rest of his days. It, it hit him at a formative time of his life. It was very traumatic. You know, of course, yada yada. We all know this. Get on with it, Lane. Um, so, yeah, it tells us a bit about the alleyway scene. This might be Doug Minch's first chance at writing this in prose. And I have to say, he's doing a good job. He calls the gunshots the sounds of hell transforming hope into tragedy by dashing life into death. Right. And I I like how he has Batman as the quote-unquote writer say at the beginning that You know, perhaps some of this might become a little too melodramatic. So maybe that's the author saying, yeah, most of the time Mm -hmm. I write plots and dialogue for comics. I don't really get into the descriptive. Mm -hmm. Maybe he's he's, uh, giving a little nod toward the possibility of him doing that. So far, so good, though. I, I don't think he's going too purple into his prose it might be you know maybe a little melodramatic right but it's not off-putting if it sets the mood in my opinion anyway we read about young bruce watching this murderer disappear in the shadows never to be brought to justice and as he grows his main focus is the physical He wants to be able to, quote-unquote, beat up the bad guy. So all of his attention is focused on just opening up a can of justice on these people or this person specifically. But it was actually Alfred who kind of put the brakes on a little bit and said, yes, you you need to to train your body, but you also need to train your mind. And and in this introduction, uh, he, he recognizes that. You know, we we get that. It says, as a youth, I owed much to Alfred, perhaps everything. And as a man, my debt is no less. On the heels of Alfred's advice, he began to study every conceivable aspect of criminology, pathology, and profiling. Some of the courses that he no doubt audited at Mm -hmm. Gotham University were um, anatomy, odontology, acoustics, chemistry, 
entomology, physics, ballistics,、mm-hmm. serology, toxicology, geology, psychology, molecular biology, fingerprinting, <laughs> DNA typing, anthropology, even、wow. archaeology, and more. Which were sort of somewhat related to those to those icons, you know, not not exactly one to one, you know, but it was things like you know psychology and toxicology and DNA and fingerprints and chemistry and so there are there are overlaps or comparisons with those with those elements of forensic science discussed before and the training that he gives himself here. Because he no longer only wants to beat up the bad guy,、mm-hmm. he wants now to find who the bad guy is. In, in terms of applying that to Batman, in 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 particular, there are, you know, a handful of different versions of this as to who the killer is, whether he catches the killer, whether the whether there's something deeper mob ties or even something. Bigger than that, and I guess the same thing sort of goes with、uh, with Spider Man as well. And I like I like the randomness. Oh, for sure, me too, me too. It turns the foe into a more abstract character rather than just one person who you know Batman can take down and that's that. When it's something that's more abstract, I don't know. I just it just makes it a bigger enemy, a bigger task, one that cannot be. Completely overcome. I like the random either mugging or whatever it is、uh, of of this, because that's something you're probably never ever going to stop that from happening. And I and and, and he m- makes it clear here. I guess it's here in 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 the introduction, or maybe the the prologue where he talks about the the never ending battle. And if it's if it is about simply avenging his. Parents, then there is an end to that. I like the the idea that Batman has given himself a incompletable mission. It's similar to we read uh, the uh, the Spectre's origin a while ago and talked about that. And again, the Spectre is given the given the task of destroying all <laughs> evil before end of business day on Tuesday. Good luck with that, and that and that is. That is basically the task that Batman has given himself, and that is a good luck with that, buddy. Yeah, it's 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 impossible. And how does he handle such an impossible task? Yeah, healthy Batman says, "If I can just help one child, then I've been a success." Unhealthy Batman says that if even one ever has to suffer this again, I failed. Right, those the two extremes of of interpreting his mission, and I've actually heard him express both of those. I think so. You know, I think he probably bounces from pole to pole. So he has all this training, both physical and mental. Yep,、yeah, talks about maintaining peak physical ability and conditioning is crucial, as is remaining abreast of cutting edge forensic developments, if not ahead of them. He still doesn't know quite what to do with it. So this is the famous scene where he's sitting in his father's study, and a bat comes crashing through the window. Good thing it wasn't a rat scurrying across the floor. <laughs> right, Rat Man. Da 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 da. That's the gist of this chapter. Is just telling us why Bruce Wayne is motivated to study. All these sciences that will help him with criminology, and not just buff up his body to become a fisticuffs type of superhero. But it is a nice. It 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 sort of serves as both an introduction to Batman. I mean, we're we're recapitulating again this version of the origin story, and then also laying the groundwork for what this book is going to be, and the and the focus on this book. And I think that's important in terms of the character of Batman. I think that I think that's why the the detective aspect, the the rational, emotionless, if you will, aspect is an is such an important part of his character, because otherwise you have Jean Paul Valley, or you have the Punisher, or you have a million other vigilantes who are just beat 'em up thugs. 
And Batman is not above dangling someone by their ankles to get a little information when you need it. But he is also going to use, wait, what's on this list? Acoustics and serology and psychology and all of those scientific things as well. And it, it, it is that, uh, that, that combination that is part of what makes Batman a compelling character for all these years. I really like this last paragraph. Um, would you mind reading it for us, Professor Allen? Despite all my best efforts, I can never turn back the clock to make things right. But as the Batman, soon to enter Gotham's dark quarters and deep shadows, I can and will prevent future wrongs by opposing death every night for the rest of my forever altered life. That is the vow I will bring to my parents' graves, the same vow I will take to my own. So that's it for this time, Gothamites. For next time, we will be reading this section called Every Contact Leaves a Trace. Yeah, when you, when you look through the, the table of contents, there are a lot of these that are four pages, six pages, ten pages. And, you know, as we get through this, I imagine we'll, we'll combine some of those, obviously. But there are also some that are more like 20 pages, and this is by far the longest, close to 40 pages. So I think definitely t- tackling this next one one chapter or one case file is the the way to go. Until next time, Gothamites, happy reading. This is going to be fun. No. All the stories I've heard about you...